Good afternoon, and thank you for coming and in the weather. Um, this is the third lecture in this series, and the overall aim of the, this series and the one next year is to look at some of the ways in which faith communities, and particularly in uh, respect of my own knowledge of this, uh, the Christian faith, uh, relates to some of the very important issues raised by the relationship between faith and belief on the one hand and aspects of a liberal, political, legal and economic order on the other. And the churches have found it quite difficult, uh, as you see more or less any week on the news, to cope with some of the legal issues um, that are being thrown up at the moment. But in the, these lectures this year, I'm concentrating on the relationship between uh, religious belief on the one hand and the market economy on the other. And of course this is quite a salient issue uh, for the churches. Um, you only have to go back to the Occupy movement uh, to see how discomforted the church can be by um, uh, th 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 those sorts of responses to the market economy and the new Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, has, is not only serving on the banking commission of both Houses of Parliament, but also has expressed sympathy for the aims of the Occupy movement. So this is a sort of salient issue. And um, the aim, as I say, of these lectures is to try and tease out various aspects of these uh, relationships and responses. Um, and so far I've looked at what might be called the moral foundations of markets, what is it that underpins the idea of a market economy, because if the Christian position is going to be able to make some contribution, it has to be on the moral issues related to economic life, not on sort of technical issues. That, um, so I'm trying all the time to sort of focus on precisely where the moral problems are. And in the first week, uh, uh, first, first of the lectures, I concentrated on the moral foundations of markets, which is also something I'll be coming back to in the next two or three lectures. And then last time I looked at the role of freedom and choice in relation to markets. And today I want to look at the idea of justice and markets. Um, this is important, I think, from the uh, from a, a, a religious point of view, in that one of the things that uh, nearly all religious communities have majored on in relation to how they see the market economy is the idea that the free market uh, does not secure, in their view, social justice or distributive justice. And this is the central th part of their critique of the market economy that it in fact neglects uh, the issue of justice and produces outcomes which are unjust. And the aim of the churches has been very much to mount a kind of critique in terms of the idea of social justice. But we have to recognize, I think, that many of the defenders of market economics are extremely critical of the idea of social justice, that it may be part of the common currency of religious believers' um, attitude towards markets, but from the point of view of market theorists, it is not an ideal which has very much meaning or very much coherence. And what I want to do today is to try and set out what the kind of market critique of the idea of social justice is, and then to look at how uh, one might respond to that. But it would be quite wrong to think that everybody believes in social justice. You only just have to think of one of Friedrich Hayek's books, um, Hayek being one of the uh, great uh, defenders of market economics, uh, the second volume of Law, Legislation and Liberty, uh, is called the mirage of social justice, that the pursuit of social justice is just illusory 
and will produce all kinds of rather negative political and social effects and that rather than pursuing social justice uh, we should in fact uh, adopt the morality that the market itself can cope with. So what are the, what, what are the reasons for the free marketeer uh, rejecting the idea of social or distributive justice? Well, there are several elements to the uh, critique. The first one is that justice and injustice can only be caused by intentional action that lots of things happen to people. Your cabbages might grow well in your cabbage patch. My cabbages might grow badly in my cabbage patch. The reasons why yours are growing well is that you've had more sun. The reasons why mine are growing badly is that they've got waterlogged. Now, these differences between us are not the result of intentional action. They are the result of the impersonal forces of nature. And we wouldn't regard those, our relative situations, as being unjust. The one whose cabbages have grown has been fortunate. The one whose cabbages have died has suffered misfortune. But there's a big distinction to be drawn between misfortune, on the one hand, and injustice on the other. Injustice has to be caused by the intentional action of an identifiable agent, not be the result of some impersonal force or power. Now, following that idea through, the argument against social justice is fairly straightforward because in the view of market theorists like Hayek or Buchanan or Milton Friedman and so forth, the outcomes of markets at any particular point in time, the outcomes of markets are not intended by anybody. In a market, millions of people buy and sell, and obviously they buy and sell for all the intentions and desires and purposes that they have. And no doubt each of those transactions can produce injustice if I swindle you or if I coerce you to buy something or whatever it might be. Those are certainly injustices and they're injustices because they're caused by the intentional action of a particular agent. But the aggregate outcome of all that buying and selling is an unintended consequence of all those freely entered into and intentional actions. That the aggregate outcome in terms of the distribution of income and wealth and assets is not itself an intentional process. And because it's not an intentional process, it isn't unjust because justice and injustice have to follow from intention. And there's a political rub to this kind of argument uh, because we might think it's obvious that the state in a liberal democratic society should be there to protect people from injustice. But if the situation of the worst off members of society in a market economy is not intended by anybody, then that situation is not an injustice and therefore doesn't fall under the role of the state to rectify it. It's a misfortune, but we don't think it's the job of the state, so this argument goes, to take people off the wheel of fortune. Certainly it's the job of the state to rectify injustice, but that's quite different from misfortune, and we should recognise that and be very sceptical of the idea of social justice. And we're misled into thinking that the distribution of income and wealth and assets in an economy has to do with intention by the very fact that we use the word distribution. Because some people might think, well, if there is a distribution of income and wealth and so on, there must be a distributor. But of course, that doesn't follow. It's not, it's a, it's a kind of, in inverted commas, distribution. It is just the outcome or the aggregate of all these individual acts of exchange. So that's the first part of the argument, 
that in so far as uh, the churches are banging on about social justice, they are not sufficiently aware, so the argument goes, that social justice has to be linked to the idea of intentional action. And that's an issue that we'll come back to in a few minutes. But there are other arguments too. The second one that's usually invoked is that it's all very well to say markets should reflect social justice. But it doesn't really work because the, um, the, the um, market should reject... Sorry, I'll start again on that sentence. We have to be aware that invoking the idea of social justice isn't very helpful just on its own as a generalisation because there are umpteen ways in which you could distribute something. You can distribute something according to need. You could distribute something according to desert. You could distribute something according to equality. Or you could distribute something towards, uh, in relation to entitlement. Well, any of these things can be the basis of a claim to a distributive share. But these criteria of social justice are not, um, are not compatible with one another. If you try to divide up a cake at tea time today on the basis of need, you will get a very different distribution than one, say, based upon the deservingness of each of the individuals sitting around the table. Um, a, 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 the, the criteria of social justice are incommensurable. There is no way in which the criterion of desert can be reconciled to the criterion of need or equality or whatever it might be. So it's always a hard question to ask someone who believes in what they call social justice to specify whether they're talking about need, entitlement, desert, uh, contribution, equality, or whatever else. There has to be some commitment to a particular distributive principle. Otherwise, social justice is completely meaningless. It's just a, a, a generalized term, but with nothing underneath it. Now, it's part of the uh, market theorists' argument that um, it's part of the market theorist argument that the criteria of social justice, the alleged criteria of social justice, cannot be put together in some kind of coherent and authoritative manner. There is no moral authority that you can consult to determine the question of whether need should take priori priority over desert or whether equality should take priority over entitlement or any of these things. These are individual and subjective assessments of a situation. There is no authoritative answer to the question, what does justice in the terms of social justice require of us? And if there are no authoritative determinations of the links between these criteria of social justice, then to invoke it is to impose, and, and to get the state to follow through on it, is just to invoke one particular set of subjective preferences over another, and that this is itself a misuse of power in a liberal society, imposing a distributive principle on the market, which many people, because they have different principles, like I prefer need, but the, the distribution is being skewed to desert or whatever it might be, that is imposing one distributive principle on the rest of society when many people will disagree with it. And this agreement or disagreement is just a subjective preference on the part of those who hold them. So the second argument against social justice is that it, as a general invocation, it's meaningless. 
And once you try to specify what you mean by it, you will find it's intensely controversial, as between need and desert and all the rest of them. And that controversy cannot be laid to rest by invoking some kind of absolutely authoritative uh, moral uh, principle that we could all accept. Now, this doesn't mean for market theorists that justice is irrelevant, but justice has to be about the process that's going on in a market. It's about the transactions that individuals make. So it's unjust if you swindle me, it's unjust if you coerce me, and so on. Those are issues of justice and injustice about the process that goes in, in, on in a market, the process of buying and selling. And of course there can be all sorts of uh, crimes and misdemeanors about buying and selling, and those are issues of justice and injustice. And it's certainly the job of the state to provide laws to protect people against injustices of that sort. But that's fundamentally different from saying the outcomes of markets are wrong because they fail to match up to some account of social justice because the outcomes fail to do And the market theorists will often just appeal to a simple example. In a game, each individual is playing the game properly if they play by the rules. But the outcome of the game is the result of each individual playing by the rules, and you don't criticize the outcome because you think so-and-so needed to win or so-and-so uh, uh, should win this time because of equality or whatever. I've won five times, you haven't won at all, and just to maximize equality, we should pretend that you've won or something like that. That, that justice, on, justice is about procedure, about keeping to the rules or keeping to the law, in exchange, it's not about measuring up the outcome in terms of some disputed criterion of social justice. So this argument is quite important to the, uh, the uh, economic liberal position on social justice, that we can distinguish between sort of process ideas of justice and what are called end state ideas of justice which are fundamentally flawed from an economic uh, liberal point of view. And I don't think the church's position will be taken too seriously if it doesn't try to grapple with some of these sorts of issues. But these issues also go towards um, revealing the fact that a regime of social justice, a state that was trying to achieve social justice, would produce all sorts of unfortunate social effects. And these are actually related to the issue of whether there is a, a coherent account of the criteria of social justice. Because let's assume that the state is committed to the idea of securing social justice. And in order to do that, it sets up bureaucratic mechanisms, the welfare state, if you like, uh, the aim of the welfare state being to secure greater social justice on the view that I'm just looking at. Now, if the welfare state is there to secure greater social justice, it has to do that in a situation in which there is no agreement on what social justice actually means in any detail, as between desert, entitlement, and so on and so forth. The state has to act in a situation in which all of this is in moral, moral controversy. Oh, we can see that at the moment. There are big arguments about the deserving and the undeserving poor and what counts as undeservingness. Is it like uh, 
Pygmalion, you know, uh, Eliza Doolittle's father, who said he was one of the undeserving poor because he drank a little more than the deserving poor. I mean, what, what are the criteria for distinguishing between those people who are not well off uh, and, and that reflects their just deserts and those that we think um, are not well off because of no fault of their own. That in trying to figure out these issues, the state has to act in a kind of moral vacuum because there is no agreement about what these distributive principles are. So that means, and it has to mean, that a great deal of the administration of the welfare state has to be discretionary. It, it, the, because you cannot write rules of law to, as it were, render the, discretion, the necessarily discretionary power of the civil servant or doctor or whoever it might be in whichever part of the welfare state it is, accountable to a rule because you can't actually get agreement on these rules. And certainly, um, you know, in Parliament, it's obvious that there are deep disagreements about the appropriate rules for the distribution of resources, which are now almost part of a daily um, issue in the law and in politics and on the news and so on about welfare reform and what principles should inform welfare reform and where do you draw lines between desert and need and so on and so forth. And this is inevitably the case. But what it means is that it actually enhances enormously the power of state bureaucracies because they have to act in a discretionary manner in the absence of agreed rules, but that discretion cannot be made accountable properly to anybody. And then that point, just keep that in mind for a moment, that point is then linked to another very important issue. And it's this, that according to the economic liberal, the fundamental motivation of people is the maximization of individual utility or individual welfare or individual happiness or whatever you like to call it, but it is the maximization by each individual of what they think their welfare will consist in, utility or happiness or well-being or whatever. Now, if If everybody seeks to maximize their utilities, then among those who seek to maximize their utilities are in fact people who work for the state in the public sector. That the economic liberal is rather inclined to reject the idea that people in the public sector are motivated by something called the public service ethic or the public service ethos. They're not. They don't step into some kind of new moral realm because of working in the public sector, but rather they behave in exactly the same way as everybody else does, namely they seek to maximize their utilities. The big difference being that in a market maximizing your utilities actually improves everybody's position um, because you have to be competitive and um, uh, there is always the threat of bankruptcy. So you have this strong incentive to improve the position of your customer, to serve your customer, because the alternative might well be bankruptcy. But in the public sector, there's no such thing as bankruptcy. So the pursuit of individual utility takes place against a background in which there isn't the constraint of bankruptcy. What there is, is the alleged constraint of the public service ethic. But in the view of really hardline economic liberals, this is just bunkum, basically. There is no effective public service ethic or ethos. 
to constrain the utility maximizing behavior of public sector officials. And that links to the idea of discretion because if, as a public servant, I am empowered to make decisions using my discretion and you can't get away from that, then this gives my capacity to maximize my utilities even greater scope because I can't be held directly accountable to the way in individual cases in which I exercise my discretion. So in the view of economic liberals, the effect of the public sector on uh, all these things uh, is to undermine the, 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 the effect is to, to, to put a kind of an illusion of a constraint on behavior, namely the public sector, the public service ethos, to put an illusion of constraint on what is effectively utility maximizing behavior without the risk of bankruptcy and giving enormous scope for um, discretion and um, being able to get away with things. So there is a, in the view of the economic liberal, and, and there's a whole sort of part of economics to do with the economics of the public sector, the so-called public choice school, people who just accept the general point that everybody is motivated to maximize their utilities. And what you have to do is to figure out how you constrain that behavior in a realistic way, not by invoking a rather vague public service ethos. And then the final kind of argument against social justice used by the economic liberals is this, that um, if the state is in the business of distributing goods and services, benefits and burdens across society, then it's bound to be the case that interest groups, interest groups will grow up which um, attempt to argue in the public sphere that they deserve or they ought to get in some way or another this particular share of whatever is being distributed. And that what will grow up in those circumstances are coalitions of interest groups to try to extract from the state what they regard as their, in inverted commas, fair share. I say in inverted commas because there is no such thing on the economic liberal view as a fair share in the sense of a just share of this um, common pot of goods and services. Now, if the state falls victim to coalitions of interest groups, then the interest group that is likely to come off worst in all of this are those of the poor. And yet the commitment to social justice by, for example, the churches, uh, has been uh, sort of generated by this concern for the poor, that the poor are in this position and it's unjust that they're in that position, therefore we must seek social justice. But in the view of the economic liberal, the poor are likely to come off worst in an attempt to have a distributive state and the reason why they'll come off worst is because that state will fall victim to the most powerful interest groups, which are not likely to include the poor. So that, that's a further uh, sort of argument. In contrast to that, they want to say that, um, that the, the position of the poor is not to be protected by an appeal to distributive justice. Rather, the position of the poor can be best improved by the role of the tr trickle-down effect, that what the rich consume today will ultimately and over time trickle down to the less well-off members of society. In order to argue that as a, an appropriate response to poverty, 
What the economic liberal has to do, and he's already done half of it, is to dismiss the idea of social justice. Because social justice is about the relative position of the worst off members of society. It's about what's the gap between me and those who are better placed in society. It's, it's, it's about relativities, not an absolute position. Whereas from the economic liberal point of view, excuse me a moment, From the economic liberal point of view, what matters is the absolute position of the worst off. What they mean by that is, if you're, in, if you're poor, what matters to you is, am I better off this year than I was last year? What concerns you is that, not what is the gap between me and some other group in society. That's the relative position. Of it. So for the economic liberal, it becomes perfectly feasible to think that the position of the worst off will be improved most by an economic market that through the trickle-down effect makes people better off on their own terms than um, they were last year or whatever the um, threshold judgment is but making them better off in absolute terms, even if the gap, and this is likely to happen, even if the gap between the worst off and the better off increases. Because we shouldn't be bothered, and it's certainly not unjust for all the reasons I've said, we shouldn't be bothered about the inequality between the rich and the poor, so long as the poor are better off this year than they were last year. And that absolute improvement can be secured by a properly functioning economic market. So again, when the churches talk about the need to prioritize the issue of poverty um, and having a preferential option for the poor, we need to be clear about what sort of poverty we're talking about. Are we talking about curing or alleviating absolute poverty in the sense that I've just described it, and that that, on the view of the economic liberal, can be done by a free market trickle-down mechanism? Or are we talking about relative poverty, which can only be addressed by a distributive state trying to improve the relative position of the worst-off members of society by investing more in their communities or uh, having tax regimes which favour the worst off, and so forth. Now, this is a fundamental divide. In a way, it's the divide between what's come to be called neoliberalism and what equally might be called social democracy. What the neoliberal is after is a situation in which a free market economy will improve the absolute position of the poor. What the social democrat is after is a modified market economy that will improve the relative position of the poor. And there's no easy way around that kind of dichotomy. And if the churches are concerned about poverty as they are, then they need to be clear about what kind of poverty we're talking about because the political strategies and economic strategies for dealing with that poverty will be fundamentally different depending on how you understand that poverty. Now, what can be said about the critique of social justice by the uh, economic liberal? What about this idea that justice and injustice can only arise as the result of intentional action? Well, let's accept that that's so, but it doesn't exhaust the moral dimensions of the issue because, first of all, there is the question of foreseeability. We can be responsible, and often are, and definitely are in the law, we're often responsible for the unintended but unforeseen 
sorry, we, we are responsible for the unintended but reasonably foreseeable consequences of our actions. I mean, there would be no such crime as manslaughter if that wasn't true. That we are held as individuals responsible for the foreseeable consequences of our action, even if they're unintended. Now, if you transpose that to the case of the market, if the outcomes of markets are reasonably foreseeable, then you might say we have a collective responsibility in the same way as I can have a personal responsibility for the foreseeable outcomes of my behaviour, we would have a collective responsibility for the foreseeable outcomes of markets. OK, they're unintended, but that doesn't exhaust the question of moral responsibility. Moral responsibility is also about foreseeability and not just um, intention. So our market outcomes foreseeable? Well, typically the economic liberal will say no. They're largely dependent upon luck. Um, and there is, a, to use the phrase of Fred Hirsch, markets are in principle unprincipled. They depend on luck largely. And we can't then foresee the outcomes of markets and therefore my argument doesn't work. But that can't be true, because if it turned out to be the case that the outcomes of markets are unforeseeable, we would have absolutely no reason for extending markets, because why should we seek to extend markets if the outcomes of markets are always unforeseeable? We couldn't have a reason for doing it, and yet, economic liberals are very strongly in favour of extending markets to virtually any area of human life where they think they can make a difference. I mean, Oliver Letwin, I don't know what his views are now, but the uh, Cabinet Office Minister uh, at the heyday of the Thatcher period wrote a book called Privatise the World. Uh, meaning by that that markets should be introduced into virtually every area of human life. Now, that may be a desirable or an undesirable thing, but he couldn't have possibly have made that argument if he assumed that market out outcomes are unforeseeable. Because why would you want to privatise the world? Why would you want to include economic markets in every area of human life, if in principle market outcomes are unforeseeable. You've sort of dragged, you're trying to sort of pull yourself up by your own bootstraps if you really believe that market outcomes are unforeseeable. But if they are foreseeable, then the issue of collective moral responsibility comes into play. Well, that's something you'll have to think about. But the second argument is that, or a corollary of that argument about uh, intention, is that for the economic liberal, justice is about how something historically occurred. You know, that, that I had this economic transaction two years ago, and let's say um, someone swindled me or something like that. It's something that has happened and it was unjust. And in order to know about justice, we have to know about these historic circumstances. And by historic, I don't mean historic with a capital H. I mean, it could, could have happened yesterday. But we, we have to know how something came about in order to know whether it was just or unjust. What matters? to justice and injustice is how something came about. And did it come about intentionally? That's the crucial thing. How did it come about and did it come about intentionally? And if the answer is yes, then the idea of justice has a foothold there. But of course that rules out social justice in the sense of the overall outcome of markets. It's about this process justice that I mentioned. However, there's a view, particularly associated with John Rawls, the great American philosopher, and Amartya Sen, uh, the Indian uh, Nobel Prize winning economist, who 
dispute that kind of claim because in the view of Rawls and Sen, what is important for justice and injustice is not how something came about, but it's what is just and unjust is our reaction to it. Justice and injustice lies in our reaction to what has come about and the issue of whether justice and injustice matter cannot be settled by explaining how something came about. Just take a, a simple example, the one used by Amartya Sen. Imagine you're walking down a street pouring with rain and a young child, toddler, is walking. You don't know why, but he, this child is walking on his own down this street and the gutter at the side of the pavement is full of water and the child is blown over by the wind and falls face down in the gutter of water. Now, I can rescue that child at absolutely no risk to myself. But let's say I don't do it. Are we really convinced that I haven't acted unjustly, I've left the child to drown? I'm the only one who can save it, there's nobody else about. Are, you, are we really prepared to say that I haven't acted unjustly because the child was in that position as the result of impersonal forces, the wind, the rain, and so on? And that really my only obligation is to act charitably, but if I fail to act, I haven't acted unjustly. I may be guilty of a lack of compassion, but I'm not guilty of injustice towards that child. So what Sen and Rawls want to argue is that it's no good trying to determine whether something is just or unjust purely by an argument about how something came about and whether it came about through intentional action or whether it came about uh, through foreseeable consequences of behaviour or whatever it might be. It, the issue of justice and injustice lies in ourselves, in our reaction uh, towards things and so on. So that would be a, an argument against the, the view that we can settle the question of justice and injustice by um, looking into how something arose or came about. Because even if something arose entirely as the result of, um, of unintended action, um, we could still believe ourselves to have an obligation. And what about, and I'll perhaps finish on this point, what about something like a genetic disability, a genetic disorder? Now, leaving God out of it for the moment, these genetic disorders are not distributed across the population in terms of some intentional process. They are just part of the genetic lottery. So does that mean that we have, in justice, no obligations towards those who have um, suffered as the result of this impersonal process? Or is the issue about what we do about people with genetic um, constraints of that sort is the issue to be settled by saying, well, it's just impersonal, it's just a misfortune, it's got nothing to do with justice, it's got nothing to do with government and the state, or do we want to say that the issue of justice isn't settled by the fact that we can all recognise that what it is at issue here is an impersonal process which somehow rules justice out of the situation. Well, there's more to be said on this, uh, but I'll come back to it when we talk about things like trust in markets a bit later on in the, in the, um, in the series, but um, because uh, the, the issue that I haven't really tackled at the moment, but it's, first of all, it's too late today, but secondly, it has to do with this issue of trust in markets and so forth, is, uh, is the one about the diversity of potential criteria uh, for distributive justice and whether there is any way in which one can somehow uh, 
ground in a reasonably authoritative sense one distributive principle over another and so forth. But that will come up uh, as a later issue. So I'd like to have left you with the thought that perhaps things aren't quite as sort of straightforward as someone like Hayek uh, represents them as being when he says that social justice is a mirage. That if the two points I made is that if there are foreseeable outcomes of markets, we can be responsible for those foreseeable outcomes because we are responsible for, in our own lives, for the reasonably foreseeable outcomes of our behaviour. And secondly, uh, that, um, that figuring out how something occurred isn't, it doesn't settle the issue of justice and injustice because there is this issue of whether justice and injustice resides in our reaction to things, not in some historical account of how an event occurred. Um, so I, I'll leave it at that for today, but we've got a few minutes for questions if anyone wants to ask a question.